We're going to get started. I just want to say again, thank you for coming. Um, the journal, we stopped for a little while and we decided to bring it back. So we're very excited about that. And we formed our new editorial board and they are holding, well, our main editor here and um, another of our board members are here to go over some things with you guys and really make this a nice conversational, relaxing evening. So I'm not going to stick around. I just wanna, well, I'm, I'll be here, but um, I just wanna say that um, submissions are due March 14th. So hopefully this will jumpstart some people and we can get started. So Frida, it's all you, Amanda. Okay, we're gonna share our screen and there we go. Can everybody see the screen okay? Hopefully, okay. Okay, well, as Jess was saying, you know, we're just so happy that, to see such a turnout and we appreciate everybody being here. Um, my goal, as I was saying a few minutes ago, is just to make this a nice, informal, relaxed, get together of people that want to just talk about how they write and how they can write and um, you know just try to give people pointers on things that will help them uh, particularly if they are interested in submitting to the AVTE journal which of course we hope you are. <laughs> um, one thing I would like to say is uh, this is the presentation is being given by myself and Amanda and uh, Amanda is it Hakarat? Am I saying that right? Okay. <laughs> and so um, we want to encourage you to put your questions in the chat box and Amanda is gonna be monitoring that and sort of uh, as we go through these things, trying to match up questions to the slide so that we answer all of your questions in the most concise and best area of the presentation we can as opposed to waiting till the end and then flipping back through slides if we need to. So um, of course we will stick around and take questions at the end, but I just, I really wanted it to be kind of informal and um, let everybody have a good time with it. So the title of the presentation is Technician Today, Writer Tomorrow. So I'm assuming that everybody here is, is either a veterinary technician, a veterinary assistant, a veterinary nurse, or something to do with veterinary medicine. And so with that in mind, we all know that as veterinary technicians and technologists, we don't do one thing, okay? We do a lot of different things. And therefore, we all have very different interests when it comes to writing when it comes to the journal articles that you are drawn to, uh, perhaps even the journals that you're drawn to. So, you know, every, there are so many different avenues and topics that can be looked at for any journal, AVTE, NAFTA, uh, in pretty much any journal you can think of. Um, there are so many different topics. And so, you know, we're all in this together, so to speak. So how do you become a writer? Well, I follow these three simple rules. Thou shalt write what you know. So, you know, remember going back into your undergraduate years in college. And if you were in the history class, somebody would at some point say, okay, you have a term paper due, but they might want it done on a specific period of history. Uh, they certainly, the history professor did not want a term paper on heartworms. The vet tech professor did not particularly want to see a term paper in the surgical class on the history of the War of 1812. So, you know, you want to make sure that you first are matching up what you are writing about uh, to what is being asked. And then write what you know. And what I mean by that is, Write about the things that you're passionate about, because when you do that, the writing is never a chore, it's never a job, it's fun. It can really be rewarding and it can be a lot of fun. If you write about what interests you, you will, number one, put a lot more time, thought and effort into it, and you will more than likely be much more rewarded with 
the effort that you have put in it by getting a published paper. Thou shalt not force yourself to accept assignments to write about something which you have no interest in. You do not need to write about the very obscure gastrointestinal nematode of raccoons known as Ballus fiscaris procyonis if you are not interested in that. You are interested, let's say your thing is you've went through, you've done a vet tech specialty in dentistry, dentistry is your heart, that's what you need to be writing about. Never let somebody talk you into writing about something that you just have no interest in because I can tell you I have done it and it is like pulling teeth. You put it off to the last minute, it just seems so tedious trying to get things together. So always write about what interests you, what you know, and you control your destiny as a writer. Now, that's not to say if you're interested in something but you don't know a lot about it that you shouldn't write about it. But you want to make sure that whatever your topic or your title is, that you have a certain amount of passion about the topic, that you have somewhat of an authority, uh, authoritative slant to it. Perhaps you've actually had an animal with a specific disease that you've nursed through. Perhaps you've worked on a case at work that fascinated you that you learned about a disease you didn't know about before. But you know, you have some sort of skin in the game when it comes to the topic. And last but not least, you need to be excited about it because writing takes a lot of time. Writing is not something that you sit down and even do it over a weekend or do it one night. I mean, it can take days, weeks, months, depending on what you're doing. Um, just as a, to give you an example, I recently published an article with the NAFTA journal on viruses and it took probably about a week of every night working on it. And then one morning waking up, not able to sleep at 4 a.m. and writing until probably seven or eight o'clock you know, to try to finish it out. Um, you just don't do these things quickly. By the same token, with the McKernan's textbook for veterinary technicians, those chapters and that particular book, it takes up to two years to get all the chapters together and to create the book that you see when you see it McKernan. So depending on what the, the project is, as to how long it will take you to um, work through it. So you really have to have a lot of passion and excitement because if you don't, you'll never stick it out. It, get, it can get really tedious. Now, familiarity does not breed contempt in this particular scenario. Scout for outlets that reflect your genre of interest. So if you like lab animal, then write for lab animal journal. If you're into NAFTA or VTAR, or now, of course, uh, you know, with AVTE coming online. If you're interested in vet tech education, then we're the place you need to write. If you're interested in uh, an overall approach to veterinary technology, then NAFTA may be the place for you to write, or even the VTARC Companion, uh, both of which are excellent journals. A writer reads. If you are not a reader, without being forced to read or without being told that you have to read it for a class, you will not be a good writer because every time that you read something, you don't realize it, but your mind is absorbing sentence structure, correct spelling, correct use of punctuation, and you don't even realize any of that is taking place while you're reading something. But when you start writing, you'll be amazed if you're a reader, how much you will have absorbed and you just know where to put the semicolon or you know where to put the commas. And so uh, if you intend to write and write well, you should even if you do not already, you should read. And particularly if you're looking at a specific journal to submit to, read their articles to see how they're laid out, see how they're formatted, because that's one of the make it or break it points with submitting an article to a journal or to any outlet really, is that you 
format it to what they're looking for. Kind of goes back to the whole history and, and the heartworm scenario. Consider what type of articles you want to write. Now, some people love to do case studies. Some people like to do book reviews, which means you read the book and now you're writing a review on it. So there's not a lot of people out there that truly love to read textbooks. I'm probably the odd nerd out in this particular scenario. Um, I was the book review editor for uh, VTNE for, not VTNE, I'm sorry, um, VSPN for about 10 or 12 years. And I like textbooks. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to do with my office when I retire in about 15 years because it's chocker block full of them. But I like to read textbooks and write reviews on them. Uh, some people like to do continuing education articles. I love to do those if I have the time because they require you not only to write an article that is truthful and uh, educational, but also to write the questions that go with the article that people are going to pay to take an exam to get a CE credit. And so, you know, that's sort of a different um, course of a different color. Some people like to do vignettes. And when we talk about vignettes, these can be things like the quick tips or the uh, things that are just a little quick blurb about something. And those are perfectly fine. So, you know, when you start looking to write, consider what you think you would like to write. And Amanda, you may have something to add here in terms of what do you like? What do you like to write? I was just putting in chat that I heart vignettes. I do like just little blurbs here and there, nothing too hardcore, um, but more experiential pieces, I guess. Um, like, look at what I've done, look at what we can do. Um, so I do, I like little vignettes for myself personally. And, and vignettes are great because vignettes are ever changing. We can look at the articles that have been written in every vet tech journal on heartworms for the past 10 or 15 years. And other than the treatment modalities and the medications that are coming out, there's just not a, bit, a lot of difference in how heartworms started out years ago and how they are now. They're still transmitted by mosquitoes. You still need to have your animal on prevention and they're, not a, they're a bad and evil thing. There's not a whole, and there's just not a lot that's gonna change about that. But with vignettes and, and tips, Things are constantly changing in vet tech practices and educational uh, outreach that there's always something new coming out or a new way to do things. And so absolutely. You want to consider article formats and this goes back to looking at the journal that you think you want to publish in or that you're looking to query to try to get a publication in. You want to look at particularly how do they use subheadings? Most journal articles will use subheadings because somewhere way back, probably 75 years ago, some psychiatrist figured out that, an educational psychiatrist figured out that when we read, we cannot stay focused on long paragraphs. We can't stay focused on pages after pages of material. We have to have something that sort of blocks it into what would almost be considered um, small amounts of information if you can take in as opposed to 45 pages of information. And so subheadings are a great way. They're also a great way to reference different areas and parts of a paper so that when someone is looking through and they want to go back and find a specific thing, they don't have to read the whole article to find it they can go back and they remember, oh yeah, it was in this section here somewhere instead of reading the whole article. You also wanna look at how the journal formats their tables, charts, and graphs. And this is something that sometimes the journal themselves will prefer to actually format these for you. They will say, just send it to us as a simple uh, Excel spreadsheet or send it to us as just a simple table in Word and we will format it. This is normally the case uh, with the little chart that you see up here that says table one and it's brown, green, and sort of a gray color. The journal actually formats this and they format so that everything, it doesn't necessarily look the same, but everything is 
um, consistent as far as the way their tables look, the way they're referenced. Uh, same thing with charts and graphs. And then pictures. Now, pictures can be tricky. Some journals do not do a lot of pictures in their articles, especially some of your heavy, heavy scientific journals. They will, they will do charts and graphs. They will not have a lot of pictures. We are very fortunate in that all of the vet tech journals love pictures. And so the biggest challenge you have here is to make sure that the picture is clear and that it's going to reflect well on paper or on the screen now that we're getting more into our journals going to an e-format. And again, once an article is accepted, your editors uh, will help you with that in making sure that things look appropriate, that they're not blurry. Um, and, and I'll give you a perfect example here. If you look at these pictures, the cat in the swimming pool, that image is extremely sharp. The dog, not so much. Um, the dog is too close to the camera. It's blurry. And you really can't see what, I mean, I only know that this dog is sitting in an F-10 pickup truck because I know the dog. But if you look at this picture, you really aren't quite sure where he's at or what the whole reason for him being there is, as opposed to the cat in a swimming pool. Oh, look, it's Esther Williams, the cat. You know, she's swimming in a swimming pool. Um, so the, the picture should support your article and show something so that you're not having to use a lot of words to continue explaining something. Language, again, this goes back to reading the, the journal and looking at articles that have been previously published. You really wanna make sure that you're writing in the language that they expect for their journal because all journals have either a relaxed or a very professional use of language. And so, um, I would give you a comparison of, I feel like NAFTA, um, you know, the VTARC Companion, and hopefully uh, our journal of AVTE that, that's coming back, they are somewhat, while they are professional journals, they are written in a more relaxed format as opposed to the AVMA journal, which is very scientific, to the point, no pictures, you know, charts, yes, graphs, yes, but it, and, and some of the articles honestly have to be, have your marks manual besides you to understand what you're talking about. So making sure that you're writing in the language that's, and the, that is expected for that particular journal. Hey, you'll read a couple questions here in chat uh -huh. just to um, keep caught up here. Do we have past editions? I feel like I should know this. Do we have past editions of the website or of the journal on the AVTE website for folks to maybe reference and look at what we did? Okay. We do not at this point um, because that would be going back to like 2017, I think, or 2016. So I don't know that we do. Um, I, I don't even know that. And, and Jess, you might be able to answer this if that's even something that's even still floating around in the archives anywhere. Not that I've found, honestly, but we can do a little more digging to see if we can find something. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the question was kind of uh, referencing if we were going to follow that format. And I think the board um, has spoke about what we kind of want to see in terms of how many articles of each type and variety um, and, and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see if we can dig up some, some past things. Uh, the other questions we have, what point of view should articles be written in? And is that dependent on the type of article? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, what point of view should oh, these articles oh, be written in? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So first and foremost, um, articles should not be written in first person. I did this, she did that. We all went and did something. They should, you know, they should not be written in first person. Uh, articles for this particular journal, because we're all about vet tech education. And so it is going to be experiential, if you will, but it should be written from the standpoint of, if you, for instance, if you're writing an, an article on how to teach parasitology during the pandemic when we can't get in a laboratory, 
certainly this is going to reflect the writer's own personal experience, but it should be written from a standpoint that is both professional in the way that you, you know, your material, your methods, your things that you utilize, as, as well as in a relaxed enough atmosphere that you can throw in your own personal uh, hints and tips on how you made this work. Or maybe it didn't work. There's nothing wrong with that either. Sometimes articles about what didn't work are just as important as what did work because you find out what you really don't want to do or, hey, we did it this way, but if we do it again, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And we think that will fix the problem. So uh, certainly uh, I, I hope that hasn't muddied the waters more than it uh, clarified. I think that's good. And, you know, we have a question on citations with photos. Um, we do have a piece on citations a little bit later. So we'll keep an eye on that and make sure that we, uh, we correct. Yes, we, we also, at the end of this presentation, we actually have a reference page for this presentation in which the photographs are referenced. And so we'll share that with you just so that you can look at it. Um, so as far as the journal submissions, um, topics, you can have suggested topics and you can have submitted topics. And the difference is a suggested topic is when a journal is looking for a specific topic for a specific month or issue. And for instance, I just saw today, the NAFTA journal came across my um, email today and this month's NAFTA journal was on uh, policy about the name change and are we going to be veterinary nurses or are we going to be veterinary technicians? And so the whole journal is basically on policy and the politics of what the states are thinking about in terms of how they're going to solve this uh, current question of what we're going to be called. There are I think there might have been one article that was related to animal health, but the majority of this article of this particular issue, uh, starting with the, the the front page of the journal, is all about policy, and so that's a suggested topic, and it would be considered to be a solicited topic. So, uh, you know, we're going to put together a journal issue on policy. So we want to reach out to technicians that that's what their passion is, is in the uh, politics of veterinary technology and the naming of the, you know, the, of what our degree is and, and the naming of what we are going to be called once we're licensed. And so you would look and seek out people that that's their interest and their passion. As opposed to submitted topics is where you are fascinated with a particular topic in vet medicine. So you send a query letter to a journal introducing yourself and the topic that you wanna write about. You tell them why you think it's important, why you think it fits for their journal, et cetera, et cetera. This is considered to be unsolicited. Both of these are considered to be good journal submission strategies. And so now, by the same token with submitted topics, if you happen to get a hold of the list for a journal that says what each month is going to focus on, then you can submit your query if it's on something you're interested in and match up your interest to the month that they're going to be talking about that particular interest. So, um, you know, solicited is somebody contacts you to write unsolicited if you contact them and tell them you would like to write. So with submitted topics, and again, remember, this is going to be um, going back just for a second. Your submitted is the one where you just decided you want to write something. I like to refer to this as the who cares topic, because your query letter to the editor is going to be all about convincing them that your topic matters and why it's important and who cares what you think about, you know, Balas's Garrett Procyonis. So you have to, before you submit a query, make sure that what you're suggesting 
number one, that it fits in with the journal. And number two, that it is something that technicians in our case are going to be interested in. And so you want to basically just answer the who cares question in your query letter to an editor. Now, publication guidelines, I can't stress this enough. Every journal, every magazine, every book that is going to allow for people to submit material will have some sort of author guidelines or writer's guidelines. They're going to tell you the type of format that they wish to see for their actual article. They're going to tell you about the pictures, what size they can be, and they're going to tell you how they want the charts and the graphs presented to them. They are going to tell you what reference citation uh, system they use, whether it's APA, MLA. APA is um, generally the citation method that's used for scientific writing. MLA is the format that is typically used for non-scientific slash like social sciences, history, English, et cetera. Both of these this is one of the places where MS Word really outdid themselves years ago. All of the major citation types are listed in MS Word, and all you have to do is choose the one you want to use, click on it, it comes up, you choose what it is you're going to cite, whether it's a book, a magazine article, a movie, and it throws up boxes for you to fill in. You fill them in, you hit enter, and it formats it in APA style or MLA style or any other style that you might need. And so you don't even, and then it goes one step further and will put those reference citations in the paper for you. And that's something else that uh, in the publication guidelines, some publications want you to cite within the text of the article or the document that you're writing. And they may want you to cite with a number in parentheses, or they may want you to cite with the year and the last name of the person. That is, uh, that's one of the first things that an editor will send back and say fix if it's not correct. Because when someone is an editor for a journal or a book or a textbook, it has to be formatted in a consistent fashion. So every chapter is referenced the same way. All the pictures are labeled the same way. All the graphs look similar. So you want to make sure that you're using the correct reference citation tool in the publications. And then once you have the format nailed down, that's like building the house before you put the furniture in it. And once you have the format down, font, size, margin, spacing, how we're going to cite the references, then you can just start writing. And I believe you said, Amanda, you had a question about format or about uh, reference citation? Yeah, it was about pictures uh, specifically. Um, but there is another question about uh, the use of AMA on Word. And I was just double checking my office.com account to see if I could find AMA listed in the word references, if you knew right away or not. There is, AMA is also a medical, if, if my memory serves me correctly. I have not used AMA very much. I have pretty much everything that I have ever done for anything to do with veterinary medicine is APA. Um, however, AMA does look at um, like you're citing in medical, specifically medical journals. And so um, again, it, there's about nine or 10 different types of citation formats out there. And so the, the key is to match up what that journal tells you they want, because if you cite it in the wrong one, that's the first thing it's gonna send it back to you. Now, somebody asked about pictures, um, pictures, slides, videos, line drawings, et cetera. So in this day and age, because we're able to snap the picture on the phone and then transfer it to the computer, save it, and then 
cut and paste it into a PowerPoint. You don't usually run the risk of losing your pictures. However, in days gone by when you had to actually take the picture and then you had to physically mail it to someone, it goes without saying, do not send your only anything. Send a copy. Because generally editors with things that have to be mailed in, unless you send a self-addressed stamped envelope, they have a no return policy. They're not gonna send anything back. And if they don't need it, it's gonna go in file 13. And we all know where file 13 is, right? So, you know, it's, it's all gonna, end up in a trash unless you send something and direct them to ship it back to you. In this day and age, because now we're doing everything electronically, I don't really think that that's as much of an issue as it used to be because you have, obviously you have a copy on your phone of the picture, you have a copy on the computer. So uh, that's not nearly as big of a deal anymore. Now with your references, um, as I said earlier, checking the author guidelines, uh, making sure of, oh, how do they want the citations listed? Some journals want them listed alphabetically. Some journals want them listed according to where they are in the document. So you list them according to the first citation, second citation, and on down the line. You, do, you want to make sure that your references are suitable. And again, here I'm referring uh, with in mind our AVPE journal, you know, journals, clinical textbooks, conference proceeding, websites are wonderful as long as they are EDU or GOV, you know, university or governmental, or national association or, you know, national groups. For instance, you, could, you can't go wrong citing the CDC. Okay, you can't go wrong citing a university. You can go wrong citing Wikipedia. Hey, Rita, a couple oh, questions on that. Um, yes. just, just to confirm, and this is my favorite slide, by the way. I'm sure it's everyone's favorite slide. Um, just to confirm, AMA is what's listed in our board guidelines for submission. Um, just to make sure, and Jess has a link to those guidelines in case anybody wants to look at that. Okay. Um, but following along with citations, how do you determine what needs to be cited? Is it amount of the work that you're referencing? And that's, that follows up with plagiarism too, if no, you want to address all of that. that. That's a good question from the standpoint of it, there is no one answer, okay? Obviously, we all know if something's in quotation marks, it needs to be cited because you're citing what someone said. However, anytime that you cite or anytime that you write another person's work into your article, you want to make sure you give credit where credit is due. Now, that doesn't mean you need to cite every sentence, okay? You don't need an annotated bibliography. But if it's Sometimes it could be, you might have two or three citations in a particular paragraph, particularly if it is uh, something where there's more than one point of view on something, okay? You're writing about heartworms and you have some people that say, well, we have got to treat the heartworms and then the animal has got to stay calm for six weeks. And then you have other people that say, no, if you just go ahead and start giving the preventative to the positive dog and eventually everything will die and he'll be fine. And then you have some people that say, well, if it's over a certain age, you may actually be doing more harm than good by trying to treat the animal. So, you know, there's a lot of different views there. And if you're covering all those views, you certainly want to cite each individual entity in terms of what their view was. So you might have two or three citations in that paragraph on treatment of heartworms. You might have another paragraph where you're talking specifically about mosquitoes and you may only have one reference citation from the American Mosquito Society, which yeah, that really is a thing. <laughs> so, you know, you may uh, only cite a the AMS at the end of the paragraph. You know, but it's something that you, you really have to um, develop a feel for. And that's where the editors come in when we receive um, 
journal articles and, and queries and you read through them and that's part of an editor's job is to say, hey, need a reference citation here. Because anyone that works as an editor and has read countless number of uh, journal article submissions, you develop a feel for when there needs to be citations. And so uh, rest assured that if you send something in and you have a beautiful reference page, but you're a little weak on what you actually cited in the document, that's where your editor helps you, okay? An editor is not just about chopping you off at the knees because it's not something they want or telling you, yeah, we'll publish it. An editor works with you from the time they accept the article, they actually work with you all the way through until it actually gets printed or you know, in that journal. So uh, they really can be your best friend. And I will tell you this, as somebody that has written for a long time and has a stack of rejection letters that I saved in a scrapbook to remind myself that, yeah, you're really not that good. <laughs> you know, you're, you, you need to just, you know, calm down a bit. You're not as good as you think you are. Is you can, you have to lose the ego at the door when you start trying to write because nobody writes the perfect article on the first go around. There is always room for improvement. There's always formatting that needs to be fixed. And at the end of the day, it's not personal. Your editor is there to help you and to make you look as good as you can because at the end of the day, an editor, say, working for McKernan, you know, with the McKernan book or working for Wiley Publishing, that editor is only as good as the product that they can bring through the door. And so if they see something in a person that they feel like they can work with and, and make you even better than you already are, they will go to the ends of the earth to make you look as good as possible. So one more thing on that, does the number of citations depend on the article type? For example, a case study might be expected to have a minimum number of citations or a standardized amount versus maybe the teaching tip that may or may not have any citations. That's exactly, and, and vignettes often have none. A vignette, as you were talking about earlier about you know teaching tips or, or a new way to put in a catheter or, or do some sort of clinical uh, adventure, that may not have any citations unless you're just gonna cite that, you know, in the past it's been done this way as referenced by somebody else. Um, but you're absolutely correct. Um, the, a lot of times the journal will ask for no less than so many citations or they may put a limit on them. But you're absolutely correct in that the more heavily scientific the journal is, the more, or excuse me, not the journal, the article, the more references you are likely to have. Now a case study, because a case study is just what it sounds like. You're writing a, up a report on an actual medical case. It may not have very many citations at all. In fact, it may only have a citation based on a particular drug, excuse me, a particular drug that was used, or it may only have a citation referencing a certain treatment that's been tried it may only have a couple of citations. It may not have any, depending on what it is. If it's a case study on, uh, you know, you, we had an animal come in the ER and this is what we did and the animal ultimately expired, the only case, uh, the only reference you might have is referencing the drug dosages out of your pharmacology book, you know, to show that the, that the proper sequence occurred in the way the animal was treated. So with references, um, one thing, and I cannot stress this enough, you should never cite Wikipedia in a journal article. And I know I will have folks out there that are shaking their heads and they're saying, oh, but Wikipedia is wonderful. Yes, Wikipedia is wonderful. It's, it's a very interesting concept. However, comma, the problem with Wikipedia is that Wikipedia is something that is reader, is to a degree reader generated. And so if you look at some Wikipedia articles and they'll say no citation, they'll have some information and it'll say no citation here. That means somebody wrote that in because they heard it 
saw it on TV, read it somewhere, but don't remember where they read it. They cannot cite that that is actual reportable data or reportable facts. And so I will give you a very good example. And I actually, this actually happened. I love history and I particularly love history that's around World, World War II. And I was looking up something one day on General George S. Patton, who was a very famous general in World War II. And somebody had put in a Wikipedia document <laughs> that George Patton was killed by the last bullet fired during the last battle at the Bulge, during the Battle of the Bulge, and was killed at the Battle of the Bulge. And that is, in fact, totally erroneous. And I actually did the Wikipedia thing and reported it as erroneous because George Patton actually survived World War II and went on to be the governor of Bavaria when the US uh, basically went into Bavaria and um, after the war and was trying to help put Germany back together and put all of these countries back together that were pretty much destroyed. Uh, he actually was killed as a result. Well, he, he was not killed. He actually died as a result of an auto accident in which his neck was broken. And so, and this was like two years after the war, a year, year and a half after the war. So Wikipedia is a great thing when you're just trying to look something up just because, but it's not something that you want to cite references for a journal paper. I would not put my name on anything that had a Wikipedia reference citation. And so, um, you know, enough on that. So, okay, so now you've kind of got the gist of, um, you're either sitting there at home going, oh, I can't wait to get started, or you're getting ready to turn us off and go do something else because this is way more than I want to do. <laughs> and I hope the majority of you are sitting back in your easy chair and getting ready to take notes because you want to write an article. Draft an outline. Once you have a topic, go back to high school English. Draft a real simple three-part outline. Nobody else is going to see this but you. It's actually an outline to this day. I do them for everything I write because an outline is a map. It's you drawing a map of how you think the paper is going to look when it's finished. And so you can do it as simple as, you know, just an introduction. The introduction always is where you want to make the case for why this is an important topic and then get into the discussion and then the conclusion and have, you know, each area should be, have its own niche. So, you know, with the discussion, if we have three different sections to that discussion, perhaps let's just, um, in fact, we're going to, I believe I have one here. I'm going to skip over a few things for a moment. Here we go. Okay, so this is, actually a paper that I wrote years ago, uh, and it was actually published in what used to be the Vet Tech Journal, and this was before NAFTA, so this was way back in the day in about 96 or 97, but basically your introduction, this is the who cares area. The common green iguanas were very popular as pets, they're easy to handle, they typically have a very long lifespan, so you know they're going to be around a while. My discussion, I looked at specific things that had to do with handling and caring for a common green iguana as a pet. So environmental factors, housing and temperature, nutrition, they're omnivorous. So they eat meat, they eat plants, they have to have water. Handling techniques, these guys may look tough. They may look like miniature dinosaurs, but you can injure them. They can also injure you, as I found out when I got whipped upside the face with a tail one day. So, you know, they do have, uh, there's, there's that necessity to avoid injury to the animal as well as yourself. And of course, also, um, uh, most reptiles, we should be thinking about things like salmonella with handling them. So your uh, common green iguana does not need to be riding on top of your head. You do not need to be kissing your iguana. Um, you know, you need to wash your hands after you handle the little guy. Then we have physical, because this was a vet tech uh, journal. So 
we have a physical exam, the normal versus the abnormal. I wanted to cover observation as far as just looking at them, their skin, uh, eyes, mouth, and nose, because these are the common areas that you see problems with them. The diseases they have, uh, parasites, metabolic bone disease, and digestive issues, and then pharmacology when they may have to be anesthetized for a procedure or if they have to be euthanized. And of course, then a conclusion. And so you just, this is a map and you have this, any one of you could take this um, outline and craft an article that would be updated from what I did years ago, and you don't even have to go figure out what you're going to write about. All you have to do is just basically, instead of filling in the blank, you just have to fill in the paragraphs. Now, I will tell you one thing that when you do an outline, everything occurs within the outline in at least two pieces. So for the introduction, you would want at least an A and a B. You could have more than that. You could have an A, B, C, D, and E if you wanted to. But just like here under discussion, environmental factors, we have two things. Nutrition, we have two things. Handling, two things. You always want to make sure that you have at least two topics or subtopics under each one of these areas, in the, especially in the discussion. So jumping back here, so you're going to draft this outline. Again, it's a map, and it's also a map that changes continuously. You can continue to change this. I mean, you can tweak it as you're moving along, and it will be the best tool you've ever had for creating the best article you can. Now, this is just basically the parts of the outline, um, you know, giving you what I just told you a moment ago. Basically, your introduction is the who cares or so what area. Um, you know, this is a brief overview. One to two paragraphs is enough. Uh, the discussion is the heart of the article. It's where everything pretty much comes together and coalesces as far as what you're trying to get across to your audience. It does require heavy documentation, citation, and a lot of references, depending on what it is, of course. And it will generally be several paragraphs or pages in length. So this is going to be the, the biggest portion of the entire project. Now, when we were in high school, everybody told you that when you got to the conclusion, you needed to go back and revisit everything, the high points of the whole paper in your conclusion. That was true in high school English, but it's not true in writing for journals or writing for um, textbooks. The conclusion is the only place in a journal article where you as the author can state your opinion. And so, again, not writing in first person, but you can state your opinion about we had those three different scenarios for dealing with heartworms and dogs. You can state your opinion about the author feels like the best course of treatment is and then why. You never want to say I or we. It's always something along the lines of the author of this article or the author feels like or the authors if there's more than one. Uh, and also, don't rehash the whole article in the conclusion. It's okay to bring back or to bring up a fact or two to make your case for why you think something should be, but you don't need to rehash the whole article. Okay, so um, Amanda, you're getting awful quiet there. So we're doing the, good on the chat. I think uh, I think everyone's soaking it in, taking really big notes. Well, let me ask you this: um, Have uh, do you use the outline? Uh, and Jess, you might chime in here also. Do either of you use outlines when you write? Yeah, so that came up in chat actually, um, that sometimes an outline maybe is too formal and it's hard to fill in the blanks. I like doing the old school grade school version of like the mind map where you put a word and circle it and then a stick off to the side and another word and idea. I kind of go both ways. I like the outline headings, but I'm, I'm not as formal sometimes like mm -hmm. that. Um, and I do sometimes like to just throw all my ideas out there 
even if it maybe doesn't make sense at the time, um, mm -hmm. and then kind of edit myself as I put it together in more of a formal way. Jess? And, it, and, and that's exactly what I tend to do with, I, I draft the formal type, if you will, outline, but what I find that helps me do is it slows me down to make me focus because I have a tendency to get really into what I'm writing. And then the first thing you know, it went from heartworms and dogs to heartworms and dogs and other canids, including wolves, lemurs, and Siberian tigers. <laughs> and then before you know it, it's something that has went so far off the beaten path that even I can't follow it. And so by doing an outline, it does cause me to pull myself back in and, and not get too over the top because you're right. When you first start trying to decide, well, I'm going to write about such and such. And sometimes just sitting there, like you said, drawing it, it makes it clear because you start seeing what, well, now, wait a minute, this is going to be too much or, oh, they said it can't be more than 3000 words, which 3000 words may sound like a lot, but you'd be surprised if you really get into something and all of a sudden you you're at 5000 words, you don't know how you got there. So, but um, I think that any way that a person wants to use the whole outline concept, whether it be doing it as a formal outline or drawing or boxes or, you know, a spreadsheet, I mean, however, whatever works for you, that's what you need to do. And that's what gets you jump started. Now, I will tell you this, when you write your first draft, and they used to always call this the rough draft. It is in truly, it truly is the roughest of the rough because you're going to go back and you're going to edit it. You're going to change it. Sometimes you're going to throw it away and start over. And then you're going to send it to an editor and they're going to do the same thing. So once you're ready to do that first draft, you write it, then you reread it, you look at it. This is where you start adding to it, changing it, deleting it. Uh, you know, maybe you all of a sudden realize that it, there's not as many references after as you thought there would be for the topic. And that sometimes I have done first drafts and then abandoned the project because there just wasn't enough out there to make a good article according to what the a journal wanted. Once you have a second draft, put it away for a couple of days or a week and forget about it. Go do something else. Then come back and read it again. And you're going to be amazed at what you're going to see that's good about it and what's not quite so good about it. You're going to notice the spelling and the grammar. You're going to be more tuned into the citations and the formatting. You're, you know, it, because here's the thing, when you write something and you're writing and you're reading and you're rereading and you're rewriting things. And then before you know it, it all, it, and it's been proven, we don't always see what we read is not always what's on the paper. Okay. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but you will read something and then someone else will read it and say, well, that just doesn't make any sense at all. It made perfect sense to you, but you're writing the paper because your head already knows what you're going to say before you get to that sentence. And so a lot of times what we read is not necessarily on the paper, it's what we understand about the topic. And so find somebody else with the third draft give it to somebody else to read. I had a very dear friend that was also a practicing vet tech. I've been in academics most of my career. She has been a practicing vet tech most of her career. And whenever I write something on a, a particular way of doing things or a particular um, type of uh, procedure that, you know, we may do it a couple of times a year in the vet tech department, she does it every other day. I'll give it to her and ask her to read it. And does this make sense to you? Because she's going to pick out the things that she knows are the, the sticking points, if you will, that can cause somebody not to understand something. You know, you, we can all write how to draw blood. We can all write a nice thing on how to put a catheter, a, an IV catheter in. But 
the person that does it every day is the person that will be able to tell you, you know, that there's certain things that may work better with short-legged dogs than long-legged dogs. The worst day of my life is when I have to put a IV cephalic catheter in a corgi. Corgis do not have legs. As far as I'm concerned, corgis are very beautiful. They're sweet dogs and they run around on little stumps. <laughs> There's just not a lot of room to put a catheter in. So there, you know, you handle these, these things a little differently than say you would a German Shepherd where you've got, you know, a half a foot of vein to, to deal with. So find yourself a proofreader that can look at it, that knows about the topic. It does, it need, does need to be somebody that understands the topic. And they're going to be able to also point you toward things that maybe need a little bit more explanation or maybe there's some errors and because trust me, after you read it so many times, you're not actually reading what's on the paper. You're reading what you think you wrote or what should be on the paper, I guess is a good way to say it. Okay, so here is for APA style. This is just to show an example of how things are referenced and they're pretty similar in all of them. Um, as far as the name, last name comes first, then the publication year date, then the title. Uh, with the websites, obviously we have to cite the actual website. And with textbooks, um, you also cite, instead of where the journal article, it would be, you know, what journal it was in. Uh, with the textbook, it would be what textbook company actually um, produced that textbook. Video citations, now videos are very similar to pictures, um, but here's how you would cite these. Same thing, last name first. Uh, publishers, you may have a director. In this case, the publisher and director is one and the same. Uh, the year, this time we were, I, I'm not sure why you would want to uh, cite Sophie's Choice, the motion picture in a vet tech article, but here we go. Uh, motion picture, who were the stars? And that's just the main stars. That's not everybody in the cast. And then what studio produced it? With lectures, very similar to like textbooks as far as uh, last name. Now with lectures, you generally put the entire date of when that lecture or speech was done. And in this case, this was a um, reference of the resignation speech for President Richard Nixon and where it was presented. Likewise, if you were citing uh, this particular PowerPoint that I actually gave on October 14, 2011, uh, it was given at the Wild West Veterinary Conference in Reno, Nevada. There's the title and the date. And so there, there are some little tweaks to the way that you do this. Um, but, and, and also to the video citation pictures are very similar, okay? And we're going to show you at the end of this presentation, like I said, we actually have referenced some pictures that are in this particular uh, presentation. Here are some excellent sources and resources. Now, some of these may have newer additions, but they certainly, uh, Greg's reference manual is excellent. It covers all of the different types of citation methods. As I mentioned earlier, Word now has all of the, the major ones downloaded into their um, program. So it's very easy to do reference citations. Here is a query letter for the iguanas. And basically, if you look, uh, your, your first paragraph, you want to hook the editor. Okay, it's kind of like fishing now. You got to hook the editor. You got to get them interested in what you're talking about. You know, iguanas are becoming a favorite pet, uh, especially among people that don't have the time to, you know, walk the dog, change the litter box, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, however, they are living animals, so they do have their own requirements as far as health care. And therefore, you, I felt that an article on basic handling and husbandry would be uh, appealing to the NAFTA journal. That's your hook, okay? Editors read that first paragraph and they make a determination right then whether or not they're
Is that her internet? <laughs> okay. I was going to say, I don't think it's just me. I know. It's usually just me. So I was just checking, making sure everyone else was still moving. Um, okay. Amanda, do you want to maybe take over until she goes back? Yeah, definitely. Um, surely she'll unfreeze here in just a second. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh no. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> And you, do I need to reshare my screen? Yes, it disappeared. Okay, hold on just one second. We will reshare that screen. Okay. Well, and Arita, while you get back up again, um, we had a question about reference stuff. And like, if we can't find a piece of the reference that needs to be cited, do we just omit it? How do we go about maybe finding some of that information if it's not readily available for citation? Well, I'll tell you, that is the beauty of the internet, because there's very little that you can't put into the search engine and find something. However, um, if it is information that truly needs to be cited in order for it to be believed or for it to be considered truthful, if I did not have some sort of reference, I would have omitted. But in this day and age, it's highly unlikely that you can't find a reference somewhere, um, especially with the internet. Now, the challenge is that the reference be from something that is reputable. So, you know, you don't want to cite Good Housekeeping, Ladies Home Journal, Wikipedia, you know, those types of things. But if you are, especially with medical things, most um, oh, and also be very careful with, um, there's so many people out there that have some great websites on John's Iguana House or Susie's, you know, dog sitting business, and they'll post things about, you know, how they deal with different things. And, and that's all well and good, but be very careful when you're citing these, because again, with a journal, you are writing for an educational journal that is designed specifically to educate technicians or to whoever the journal is aimed at. And so you don't want to be putting bad information out there. And so my only thing there would be just to use your search engine, search things out as good as you can. If you absolutely cannot find any reference for something, it's probably best not to use it, you know, or use it as an opinion statement. If it's something you agree with, remember your conclusion, you know, you have a right to your opinion. And if you believe something is, you know, worthy, then you can certainly put it there because your opinion, or excuse me, your conclusion area usually is not really heavy on citation. But if you're gonna put it in the discussion area, it needs to be something that, you know, can be reputably cited from somewhere. But that's a great question. Um, so getting back to this letter. Um, so, okay, so we've made our pitch for, you know, how we, uh, what we're going to do. And then the body is going to just tell very briefly. And you'll notice every one of these paragraphs is not but two or three sentences. That's about how much, you um, of the person's attention you're going to get, okay? If they have to read very long paragraphs to get the pitch, they're gonna move on. So the body is, you know, we're gonna talk about the related interest uh, as far as the areas of interest about green iguanas, basically listing just the subheadings that of the um, outline. And then you're gonna finally, you're gonna give your credentials. Why are you, why do you feel that you are someone that should be able to write this and people should believe you, okay? This is where you get to give your CV or your resume in the form of about a three or four sentence paragraph. And then you close out with, you know, I hope this is a topic of interest to NAFTA and I look forward to hearing from you. I normally never write, and this is, this is where your ego can come into play. Egos are a good thing. I never write and say, 
you know, I hope this is a topic that is of interest to you. And I really hope that you write me back and let me know that you want me to do. No, you want to write from the standpoint of, I know this is a good article. I know this is a good topic. And I know I'm the person that could do a good job on this. So I hope this is of interest to you. And I look forward to hearing from you. Upon your assent, I can have this article in front of you within a week. Give them some sort of time frame. It doesn't have to be a week, it could be a month. But you want to give them a time frame that once you hear from them, if they are interested in the article, I can have this to you by and give them a time frame. That way they can sort of look at what they have coming up and where they're going. Okay, so you're going to submit. They said they wanted to see your article. You've written it. The proofreader read it. It's ready to go. One last time before you hit send, look at the author's guidelines and make sure that you have checked every box. Make sure that you've got the right format. Make sure that your you know, pictures are the way that they want JPEG, then make sure that that's what they get. Make sure the charts and tables are how they want them. And then send it in the requested format. If they say send it as an attachment and email, don't mail it to them. If they say send it through the US mail, don't email it to them <laughs> because they have someone somewhere is responsible for receiving these things. And they're only going to look at what they receive through the requested format that they want to receive them. You've submitted it, now you wait. You are going to get feedback. And remember I said earlier, leave the ego at the door and repeat after me, I will not get my feelings hurt. I will not get my feelings hurt when they say that it needs work or that they say, this just isn't right for our journal. It's nothing personal. Journals are a business. At the end of the day, it is a publication, it is a business, and it is put together in a certain sort of way. <coughs> and sometimes what we write works for them, and sometimes it doesn't. It's nothing personal. So they you got the letter that said, we love it. We want to see the article. So do the happy dance, call everybody, and then get to work. Now, here's the thing. Editors, unlike the postman who rings twice, the editor only rings once. If they accept it, they're going to send you suggestions and requests for what needs to be fixed. Remember, I told you earlier that it's highly unlikely any one of us are going to write an article and get it accepted the first time without some sort of changes or suggestions. But here's the thing. The minute they send it, you got to fix it and get it returned to them by the time frame that they ask for it. No negotiations, no waiting until the weekend, no waiting until next week when spring break starts if they want it by this Sunday. We got to fix it and get it back to them because once we fix it and return it, then it's going to go into the publication portion. And so now you're done. You've done it. Now, so instead of the acceptance, you've got a rejection. Look at what they said was wrong with it and go back and fix it. After you have a, cr a good cry, after you have a glass of wine, after you get mad and stomp around, pick it up, go back, fix the article according to what they said was wrong with it and submit it somewhere else. The first article I ever wrote was rejected three times. Every time it was rejected, I stomped around decided I was never going to write again. Then I threw it in a drawer and then I pulled it out about a week or two later, fixed it. And the fourth person accepted it with no changes. Now, that's the only time that's ever happened to me. And I don't say 
by any stretch of the imagination that I wrote an article that got accepted without changes. I wrote an article and revised it four times before somebody accepted it. And so, you know, that's, that's just part of the writing game. It's just, that's just part of it. So we made it, we're at the end, and I don't know if we have any other questions, but let me just share with you, here is how we did, this is the picture references, and at the time, this was actually the, um, it's not this way anymore, but this was actually the um, way that uh, Wild West Veterinary Conference wanted you to do your picture references, and now they don't do it that way, but, um, Basically, it was every slide showed where we got because they were all pretty much cut and pasted off the internet or off of different um, open stock like uh, vector openstock.com, different things. Um, however, and there was a lot of pictures, we had a lot of pictures. And this is one of my dogs, Twicky, um, named after the candy bar. And that is pretty much it for us. And I'm gonna say, is there any other questions, Amanda, in there? What, what's going on with the chat room? So chat's actually pretty caught up. I thought I might tag on to what you just mentioned and showing those links for the photos. Yes. When I've done lectures or this didn't really work so much with anything I've written because I'm not really good at using pictures in my writing, but for uh, you know talks and things like that, I will generally just put a that same little website link, but in tiny, tiny print up underneath the picture of the slide I'm on. Just another way that you could reference your photos that we all just take from Google, but they should be referenced. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, they should be. Um, it looks like, yeah, we're just... Um, noting in chat that we are going to share the information um, that you've provided us in the slides. Um, so we'll be sending that out as well as the recording um, sometime next week. Um, one thing that I would just say kind of in general um, from a very amateur publishing position, really um, y'all's voice matters. That's what we tell our students too, but our voices matter just the same. And if you have an inkling that what your idea that you wanna write about is, is a good one, it probably is. It's probably not just you. Um, I would really just try to prompt everyone. If you have an idea, share it, write something up, give it a go. Um, I've been really fortunate to um, publish in like my state association journal. That's kind of where I got my feet wet. And they were such a good group to kind of help and mentor along the way. Um, just, just submit it. Just do it. Take a chance on yourself. We want to see the awesome work that we know is out there. And, and to follow up on, on what Amanda said, that's absolutely, absolutely correct. That for those that have not been a member or have not been around AVTA or AVTE as long as some of us have. The journal was a very viable part of AVTE until about 2017. And one of the biggest factors to a journal going out of business, so to speak, is somebody has to write the articles. And if you don't have participation, you know, we can all write them, but nobody wants to hear from me and Jess and Amanda with two articles a piece for six articles in a journal twice a year. I mean, after a while, it's like, good Lord, doesn't anybody else do this? <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's important that as technicians, we all have a voice, we all have interests, and any one of us can be a writer. And so, a journal is only as strong as the membership. And so I encourage anybody that wants to try, send it in, let us look. Uh, you know, my, I've often said, if I could just work as a proofreader and uh, editing person, if I didn't think I'd starve to death, that's all I would do, because I love to edit. I love to help people make their work look good and then see them in print. It's, it's rewarding. You know, and it just, it, it allows somebody to, um, you know, put something else on their CV or their resume. So please, please feel free to send us anything you have. We would love to 
see this become more than a once a year publication down the road. And the only way that happens is if we have people that are interested. I mean, I sent in an email. I had an article I wanted to submit to uh, the AVTE journal and I sent it in, I guess in 2020 maybe or 2021. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have a journal anymore. And I said, well, I'm really sorry to hear that. But, um, you know, if you ever decide to want to do something with it, let me know. Well, here we are, you know, a year later, here we are. So it, it takes a, you know, not to pat myself on the back because we are a group. And I, I certainly am one that, you know, a journal is the work and the baby of a group of people. And it takes everybody. But it took one person saying, hey, I'm out here if you guys want to do it again. And somebody went, whoo, we got a live one on the end of the line. Call her up. <laughs> we'll get somebody to do this. Um, you know, so it, we would just love to see this journal go forward and be the best it can be and to be your voice as veterinary technician educators. So I think that is just about... Um, Everything that I have, um, it, unless there's any other questions, I'm going to kind of turn it back over. Well, let me first thank Amanda for co-hosting this with me. And Amanda, do you have anything else to add before we turn it back over to Jess? No, just submit. Take a chance. Just submit. The feeling you'll get upon submission, oh, it can't be replaced. Whether or not you even get accepted, just the feeling of doing it. Um, just try, try. We cannot wait to read all of this awesome. Yes, it can be daunting. It can seem daunting, but like even teaching tips, anything, experience is always great to share. And that's how we learn from each other. So submit, or if you want to be involved in the committee itself, send me a note, jcampbell at avte.net. But um, I just want to thank Orita and Amanda both so much for hosting this event tonight and for everyone for coming and staying a little over um, seven so we could really soak in all this information. But we hope to see your articles. I hope to see your registrations for the ABTE conference in Philadelphia. And um, just want to wish everyone a good night. And if you have any questions at all about any of this content, please feel free to email and we'll get some answers over to you.